Welcome to Numerical Methods. So we uh, started a section on random number generation. Yeah, in the background is still our application of Monte Carlo integration so that we can approximate. So, um, yeah, now with the Coxma-Lafka inequality, we have a motivation to find a sequence that has a low discrepancy. So I'm still in my section on random number generation. Yeah, but now we are moving a little bit away from the randomness. And I would like to consider sequences that do not need to come from the sampling of random variables, the drawings of random variables, that have a low discrepancy because this gives me a very good point-wise error estimate now for my Monte Carlo approximation. The P is gone. But still, this is considered random number generation. And the corresponding Monte Carlo method is called quasi-Monte Carlo. Yeah? So it's quasi-random number sequences versus pseudo-random number sequences. So that's my next section quasi-random number generation. I start with the case of one dimension, low discrepancy sequences in one dimension. So from the Coxma-Lafka inequality, we see that it's desirable to use a sequence that has a low discrepancy. So this here is my Monte Carlo integral. And I would like to have a sequence that has a low discrepancy. We already had sequences with low discrepancy. For example, if you just take xi is i divided by n. Okay, so this means I consider the interval from 0, 1. 1 divided by n. Well, which n do we take? If we take 2, it is 1 half and 1. Yeah? If the i starts in 1, yeah? so x1, x2. If we take 4 points, it is 1 over 4, 1 over 2, 3 over 4, and 1. Yeah? i is 1, 2, 3, 4. The problem is that if we take five points, yeah, or if we take three points, we have to create a new discretization. So with three points, yeah, you would have one over three, two over three, and one. So you see that the two sequences just have a single point in common, that is one, and the other two or three points have to be recreated. Yeah? So you have to throw them away. Monte Carlo had an advantage. Yeah? It was somehow an infinite sequence. So we were running on and on and on. So we could add more points. So when you check your uh, result, yeah, you could just add a few more points and improve the result. You do not need to throw away uh, the previous uh, sequence. So when we talk now about low discrepancy sequences, then I would like to have this property in addition. So what I would like to have is an infinite sequence of numbers such that every subsequence, so x1 to xm of my infinite sequence, has low discrepancy. 
So this is a low discrepancy sequence. So when we go back to my example, find a low discrepancy sequence from the interval from zero to one, then yeah, where would you place now the points using this criteria? Yeah, maybe the first one is placed here in the middle. Okay, the next one is placed here. But then you have too many points on the left side, too few points on the right side. Discrepancy is maybe still poor. Where do you place the third one? Maybe here. Okay, where do you place now the fourth point? Yeah, should you place it here? That's so far outside. Yeah? So maybe it's a little bit better distributed. Is that if I place it here? Okay, the next one is maybe difficult. Maybe we place that here. But this doesn't look good, right? So now I have so much stuff on the left side. Yeah? So maybe this guy was not good. Maybe I placed here. No? So now I have so much stuff on the left side. But now the next one yeah, should not go here. It should maybe go here. Okay, so now, yeah, it's a little better, a little bit better, it's a little bit better balanced. Okay? So, where would you place the next one? Okay, but you maybe can decide, yeah, it can go here, uh, but you can also put it here. And the next one is maybe here. Okay, you see, I have an infinite sequence, yeah, and I'm always trying to place the points in a sense such that the points are more evenly distributed. And it's maybe not so trivial. Well, at certain points, yeah, so here I was always partitioning into half, yeah, so this means whenever I'm have two to the power of k minus one points. Yeah? So this means I have two to the power of k intervals. Whenever I reach this level of these numbers of points, I would like to have an equipartitioning. Yeah, that's maybe a trivial yeah, um, side condition. The, uh, but in between, yeah, I try to balance the points a little bit. The sequence I was creating here is actually the van der Korput sequence. Yeah? So the van der Korput sequence is a good example for a low discrepancy sequences. So in one dimension. And here is the definition of the van der Korput sequence. Yeah, an infinite sequence xi in the interval 0, 1. The van der Korput sequence has a parameter this is the base b. Yeah? So b is an integer, large or equal to, yeah? two, three, four, five, yeah? the base b, and the van der Korput sequence is now defined as xi is the sum a i j one divided by b to the power of j. Yeah? B to the power of minus j, sum from j equals 1 to infinity. This is the, written here as an infinite sum, but actually the sum is finite. Yeah? Why? Yeah, because the alpha i j are 0 for j sufficiently large. Uh, you can actually calculate the index after which they become zero. So how are these alpha ij defined? The alpha ij are the coefficients here 
that represent the index i of the sequence in base b. Yeah. So i should be equal to alpha ij multiplied with b to the power of j minus 1, where the alpha ij are integers from the set from 0 to b minus 1. Okay, maybe this looks cryptic, but it isn't. Consider the case b equals 2. Yeah? b equals 2 is the first one that I could consider here. So b equals 2 means that the alpha ij is just the binary representation of the index. Yeah? The b to the power of j minus 1, this is 2 to the power of 0, 1, 2 to the power of 1, 2, 2 to the power of 2, 4, yeah? so 1, 2, 4, 8. Yeah? So these, is, these are just the values of the corresponding bits, yeah? and this is just the binary representation of the index i. Okay, and clearly now you see, of course, that alpha ij yeah, is zero, yeah, starting from a specific uh, j. So hence, above is um, a finite sum. Yeah, and then you take these binary representations, yeah, these bits yeah, from the index, and just multiply it with the, well, inverse here. So you take the coefficient in front of 2 to the power of 0 and multiply it with 1 half. You take the coefficient in front of 2 to the power of 1, Okay, there is an index shift, yeah, and multiply it with 1 over 4. Yeah. You take the coefficient in front of 2 to the power of 2, yeah, so in front of 4, and multiply it with 1 over 8. Does the index contain a 2 to the power of 3, an 8, yeah, in its binary re representation? If yes, you take here a 1 over 16. So adding one half, one over four, one over eight, one over sixteen, yeah, this remains less or equal one. Yeah? Actually, if you just add one half, one over four, yeah, then you converge to one. So clearly, this number that we generate here will be between zero and one. And also note a little bit what is done here. Yeah, I add one half, one over four, one over eight. Yeah? is what I did here in my motivation. Yeah? Do I have one half? Yeah. Yes or no? The bit of the index decides this. Yeah. Do I add to it one over four? Yeah. So then one half plus one over four is a three over four. Do I add to it a one over eight? Yeah. Then I would be here. No? So this here is actually one half plus zero one. This here is one half plus zero one over four plus one over over eight, and so on. Okay, so this is the example for the base b equals two. So here you have the alpha i j's. The alpha i j's are now the binary representations here of the index. So 1 is 1 times 1. 2 is 1 times 2 plus 0 times 1. 3 is 1 times 2 plus 1 times 1. 4 is 1, 0, 0. So these are just the binary representations of the indices. And then you take this binary representation of the index, which you have here, over to here and use it 
to decide if you multiply with this corresponding one divided by two to the power of j. So you take these guys here. So for example, the five yeah, is given by one times four, zero times two, one times one. And what you do is you take one times a half yeah, because you have the uh, one half here. So the bit in front of the one is always decided if we get a one half in our representation of the number and the bit in front of the two is decided if we get a one over four in our representation. Yeah, So for the five, this bit is zero. So I get a zero times one over four. And for the five, the bit in front of the four is one. So I get a one in front of the one over eight. Now, if you just walk now through this table, the first element of my sequence is one half. Yeah? Then the bit for the one half goes to zero, but I add a one over four. Then the bit of the one half goes to one. So I have one half plus one over four, a three over four. Yeah, then all my two bits were used. I need a new bit. The next bit is the one in front of the four. Yeah? So two two to the power of two, which will correspond to the one over eight. Yeah. So the next bit is added. It's a one over eight. And then suddenly you see that this repeats. So what you do is you take the one over eight, which is the new element, and you just add it to the values you have created before. Yeah. So you see this is one half plus one over eight, one over four plus one over eight, and three over four plus one over eight. You just take the previous part of the sequence and add one over eight. So you have a kind of refinement factor. The refinement factor is the one over eight and it's added to all the previous elements. If you think that there is maybe a hidden element zero here, you could also add the one over eight to the zero, which represents then this element here. So I add the one over eight, get a five over eight, a three over eight, a seven over eight. So the next level would be one divided by 16, which would go here. And then you would add one over 16 to all those guys. So these are the first seven elements of the Van der Korpel sequence with base two. You can also take, choose base 10. Yeah. So then this is the normal representation of the index. And yeah, if you have then an index i that is two, one, and say zero, yeah, then this corresponds to zero times 0 0.1 plus one times 0 0.01 plus two times 0 0.001. Huh? So the fractions are now powers of one divided by 10. The star discrepancy of this sequence is log n divided by n. So we have almost order one divided by n, yeah? almost order one divided by n. One divided by n would be what we achieve if we do the equipartitioning for my motivation. But this equipartitioning has the defect that we have to recreate the sequence again and again. Yeah? So note here, the discrepancy is one divided by n. Okay, so this moves up here. Yeah? And then it jumps down. Okay, so and what is the largest uh, 
yeah, deviation of counting the points and the volume you can have here. Yeah, this is just uh, the slope is one. This is just the length of the interval. The length of the interval is actually one divided by n plus one, order one divided by n. So this is almost order one divided by n, the best thing that we could expect. It is much better than what we have from placing it randomly, Monte Carlo, which is one divided by square root of n. Well, the one divided by square root of n in the Monte Carlo really comes from the thing that if you do it randomly, you have some clusters. Yeah? You have some clusters, you have some gaps, and these gaps actually cost you, you know, the one divided by square root of n here. So we place it more evenly. We have a better uh, discrepancy. The log n here comes from the thing that we do not recreate the sequence for any given n. So in between, yeah, we have a little bit clustering. We are a little bit worse. So nice thing is that we now have an infinite sequence. And this infinite sequence has low discrepancy. Yeah, It's better than uh, Monte Carlo. We can improve the accuracy by adding more points. Yeah? We do not need to recreate uh, the sequence. Yeah, this also um, is maybe a good property um, if we are considering distributing the code across multiple computers yeah, or two different cores for the parallelization. Also, another effect that is good for the parallelization is that the sequence does not require the previous element to create the next element, like we had it for the linear concurrential generators. Yeah? There was some kind of path dependency. Yeah? We need the previous element to create the next one. So we could not start a sequence that has a, a specific seed, yeah? the in initial value at x0. Uh, we could not start a sequence, say, at x10,000. To know x10,000, you either have to do some calculations. There are some formulas for skipping ahead. Yeah? To know x thousand, you either have to do some calculations or you have to run through the first thousand elements so you know what is the value x thousand and you can you can start the sequence. Here the sequence is just a function of the index. Yeah? So it is x of i. Yeah? where i is then decomposed into these coefficients alpha ij. Yeah? So it is just a function of the index. If you know the index, you can calculate the element. Yeah? So this is very nice for the parallelization. I can tell one computer, use a Fender Corput sequence from 0 to 999, and the next one is using a Fender Corput sequence from index 1000 to 1999. Yeah? So I can distribute these to different processors and they work in parallel. And in the end, I just take the sum of these um, results, yeah? or if it is Monte Carlo, just the average of these results, uh, and I have a result with this large sequence. So let's have a few code sessions now on uniform quasi-random number generation using low discrepancy sequences in one dimension. Maybe first one, let's implement a Fender Corpus sequence. Okay, I would like to implement this. Maybe I do this live, yeah? Um, Live coding always takes a bit more time, yeah, but also maybe nice to see it. We need to create a new package. Let's call it package random. And I also like to teach you creating cleaner code. 
So before I implement the Fender Corporate sequence, let me create an interface. Yeah. I would like to have an interface that is called random number generator 1D, which represents now a random sequence in one dimension, but also may represent a quasi random number sequence. So I will use this guy later in my Monte Carlo integrator. So this means if we go back to our Monte Carlo integrator, this guy was here. There in my Monte Carlo integrator, I was using hard-coded Mersenne Twister. But if I can pass now an interface to a class that generates the sequence, I can replace here Mersenne Twister with some other generator, a linear concurrential one if you like, but also with the quasi-random number generator, which means that our random number generation code is used here in the Monte Carlo integration and the Monte Carlo integration is the same code for pseudo-random Monte Carlo integration and quasi-random Monte Carlo integration. So this interface is uh, easy. I just would like to have the next element uh, from the sequence. Okay, there are also other interfaces that do this. Um, if you like to be compatible yeah, with these, then you could write here extend and say that you are extending a double supplier. So what is double supplier? So let's import double supplier and have a look at this. So the double supplier is exactly what a random number sequence is. Yeah? It provides you the next element, yeah, the floating point uh, double, yeah, that is the next one. So this guy here is actually a specification of an interface that can provide um, a floating point double number, and my random number generator is also just uh, just this. You see that. Um, here, this one has a slightly different name, get as double. Here, I just use next double, next double, because it, I, I think of a of a sequence. If you like to map now the name, you can add uh, a default uh, implementation. Yeah, So this here is now overriding uh, the uh, get as double and just returns the value of next double. So this stuff that I was just doing, yeah, you can't forget about this. It's just that we will now implement the next double method. We will implement this. We create a Fender corpus sequence that gives you the next double step by step. But if somebody likes to use our random number generator in contexts where uh, he requires a double supplier. He can also use it because uh, we also implement the interface of a double supplier. So now I have created here my interface. Let's now create my Fonda Corput sequence. So I create a new class. The class is now called Fonda Corput sequence. And this class should implement an interface so I can add here the interface and the interface is now called random number generator 1D. So I hope this one is the right one. Yes. Okay. So if you select that he we implement this interface in this dialog, actually this IDE here is a little bit helpful. He already tells me what we should do. We have to implement this method, but currently this method only returns uh, zero. So before I implement this method, let now let us now turn to the task, implement the Fender corporate sequence. So I need to implement this function. This function has the nice property that, yeah, it is uh, stateless. If I have the index, I can calculate the xi. So I can define a static. So let's implement this function for a given index and also for a given base, create the xi, yeah? So xi is now a function of which i do we use and which b do we use.
I implement this here. So public static double. This is the funder core put, say, number. I have an index that I pass. This is the i. And I have an integer, yeah, which is the b. Well, as a computer programmer, I like sequences or arrays starting in zero. So for me, the first index would be x0. But if you look here to the definition, actually the first i is a one. Now you also see this here. We start by representing the one, which is the one half. If you start with a zero, yeah, you could include x zero equals zero into the sequence. If we start with a zero and we consider the van der Korpus sequence as in the previous definition, then actually I need to shift the index by one. Yeah? So zero is mapped to one. So now I would like to create the X. So you see here that the X is actually constructed by adding certain numbers. Yeah, So my XI is a sum, a sum of certain numbers. So if I would like to calculate the sum, I initialize a variable to zero and I sum the contributions up. Yeah? So I initialize now the x to zero and I will sum the contributions up to get the five over eight. Yeah? So let's initialize the x to zero. What am I summing up? Yeah? You saw in my motivation that I'm first summing up one half, and then I'm checking, do I need to add one over four? So this is a little bit my refinement factor. So my refinement factor is one divided by B. Okay. So um, how long do I sum this up? Yeah, actually you will see that my index will drop to zero. Yeah. If I stop summing up, so I will have a while loop. Yeah. I explain you this line uh, again in a few seconds. Yeah. What am I summing up? Well, there is an index here coming in. And you see the decision if I sum up one half is actually made if I have this bit here active which means that if I divide my index by two, do I have a remainder or not? You see, this guy here is one divided by two, the remainder, uh, remainder one. Two divided by two uh, is one, remainder zero. Three divided by two is one, remainder one. So this bit here, which decides whether we have the one half is the remainder of the division of the index with respect to the base. So I divide here with the remainder. So this percentage in Java is the remainder of the division. And if this is one, then I add the refinement factor. So my X is X plus this expression. So after that, actually, you should either increase here, so multiply this remainder division here, yeah, or you can reduce the index. Because what I can do now is that after I have done this, for example, you are here in the five, yeah, then you do five divided by two, yeah, it has a remainder remainder one, but five divided by two is a two plus remainder one. So you see that you can just divide the five by two to get these other bits here. So by shifting by two, all the bits move one, one position, yeah, one position to the right. The last one is giving you now the remainder and the remaining one is still having all the other bits. So what I do is I just decrease now my index by dividing by the base. This is shifting all the bits. Yeah? The remainder has been considered. This is shifting all the bits. The next bit 
is adding a different refinement factor. So my refinement factor has to be changed. So my refinement factor is the previous refinement factor divided by the base. Yeah, So 1 over 2 becomes 1 over 4. That's it. He will stop. Yeah, assume the index is 1. What is he doing? 1 divided by 2 is a remainder 1. He will add 1 half. 1 divided by 2 as an integer division is a 0. Refinement factor is moved to 1 over 4, but he sees the index is 0, so he stops. That's it. That's the Van der Korpel sequence. Okay, so now I can complete the other code. So in order to give you the next element, actually I have to remember where am I. Yeah? So I have to remember a little bit what is the current index. Okay, so this is my current index. And I have to have a Van der Korpel sequence with a certain base. So maybe I also need a field, yeah, a state of the class that encodes the base. So now I would like to have a constructor. So you can go here and he helps you generate constructor using fields. So you can now construct this. Well, this index here is actually the starting index. So the start index is initializing here this index. So and what do we do now in the next double function? Yeah, we return the van der Korput number for my current index and the given base, and then we increase the index. Okay, after return, I cannot increase. Yeah, so I just place a plus plus. Uh, okay, there is a small error here. Of course, this cannot be final. Yeah, the index is changed yeah, uh, when I request um, a new value. Yeah, So this here will pass the current index to this function, and then it will increase, increase the index. There is a subtle subtle thing for well uh, uh, for those guys who know about uh, multi-threading um, if you want to be absolutely sure yeah that m concurrent calls to the next double will get not the same number actually we have to be sure that this incrementation here is performed atomically with the passing of the index to the function. So I cannot be sure that this here is the case, but there is a class that does this. This is a so-called atomic integer. So if you make the index to be the atomic integer, then here you have to have a new, new atomic integer of the start index, which is now an int. Okay, and then you can replace this here by get and increment. Yeah? So now it's also a little bit more explicit what is happening here. He's getting the index, and after that, he's incre incrementing it. And this atomic integer, if you read the uh, documentation, um, this ensures yeah, that it's updated atomically so you cannot get the same value twice. When he returns a value, he is internally incrementing it. And when some other guy is asking for this value, it's ensured that he gets the incremented value. So that's maybe a subtle detail. If you look up the code in our code repository, you will find this atomic integer and maybe you will ask, okay, why am I doing this? Because this function here can be called by multiple threads. If I would like to distribute it among this, uh, different threads, multiple threads, yeah. And um, I do not want that two threads get the same uh, value and then in increment uh, the index yeah, 
simultaneously. Okay, so that should be now our Fanta corporate sequence, a very small code. Yeah, maybe I do not want to specify the start index in regular applications. So maybe I would also like to have a constructor that has just base as the input. Yeah? So Fanta corporate sequence base two, base three, whatever. Yeah, so this one is gen then just using the start index zero. Yeah? You can maybe a better programming style just say that this is calling the other constructor with zero and base. Let's try the Fanta corporate sequence. Let's have a small experiment. I would like to have a main method. And now I would like to create a Fanta corporate sequence. So I can now implement against the interface. I do random number generator 1D. This should be my Fanta corporate sequence with base 2. Huh? So I can just pass the base. And now I can create a for loop. If I would like to see the first 10 elements, yeah, I just ask my sequence, give me the next double element, and I just print it out. So you see here, this i is just a, a counter in the loop. It's actually not entering into the generator, although the sequence has this property that I could also create a method that gives me the specific element. Yeah. So if I would use here get from the corporate number, yeah, but then I would have to replace this guy with the specific class. Then I would have access to this function that gives me the number for a given index. But here I'm just using the very narrow interface that does not know about this. So I just print now the i. and the X. Let's run this code. And it is like we had on the slide, right? One half, one over four, add the one over four to the one half, yeah, which gives me three over four. One half, one over four, three over four. One over eight, add the one over eight to the one half. 1 over 8, 5 over 8. Yeah. Add the 1 over 8 to the 1 over 4. 3 over 8. 3 over 8, 7 over 8, and 1 over 16. Okay, so find a corporate sequence. Next thing is, let's use the find a corporate sequence in a Monte Carlo integrator. And since time is up, maybe let's just give you this code here. This is our old implementation of the Monte Carlo integrator. So it had a hard-coded Mersenne twister. Now I modified this implementation. You can supply a random number generator 1D. Actually, I'm not supplying the random number generator 1D. I'm supplying a supplier of the random number generator 1D. A supplier is just a class that allows you to construct the object. Yeah? So just a factory method. And you see only a single line has changed. The line at which I constructed the Mersenne twister is now replaced by construct your random number generator. And you see the left-hand side is the double supplier. So what is it was maybe handy yeah, that my random number generator 1D is also implementing the double supplier interface. But that's that's a detail. The only thing is that I replaced the Mersenne twister by constructing 
the sequence from this other generator. So now I can go to my integrator 1D experiment. Recall that this was using now many different integrators. The Monte Carlo integrator, which has one divided by square root of n. The Simpsons, yeah, which has one divided by n to the power of four, already a lot, and also others. And I can just add another integrator. And now I add my Monte Carlo integrator. So integrator 1D, Monte Carlo integrator with under corput sequence. I can add this by initializing my class. So this is now my Monte Carlo integrator 1D, but the generalized one, 1D from random number generator 1D. So this one, which takes the supplier of the random number generator. Yeah. So I need to pass the number of evaluation points that I use, and I need to pass which generator of the sequence should we use. So this generator of the sequence is now my new Thunder Corput sequence, say with base two. Well, since I have to not provide the object, but a method that creates the object, I have to use maybe this little bit strange notation here. So this is just a function that has no arguments that gives you this, this result. So now I have created my um, integrator 1D, maybe fixed typos, which is just a Monte Carlo integrator that uses the von der Kuput sequence. And I can test this one. Let's now run the integrator experiment again. Yeah? And you see, I did not create very much new code for my Monte Carlo integrator. So you see, go back here. This is just the same integration rule here we are using. This code is exactly the same as for the Monte Carlo integration. Just I use a different guy creating the sequence. Okay, This different guy that is creating the sequence is our Funder Corpus sequence. Our Funder Corpus sequence. And instead of the Monte Carlo convergence rate one divided by square root of n, I have indeed something like one divided by n. Yeah? We call the n is a 10 to the power of four. Very nice. Just create a better sequence and you have a better convergence rate. This is in line with our Kochma-Lavka inequality because now the van der Korput sequence has here a discrepancy of log n divided by n, over one divided. So these were our code sessions. So we did the van der Korput sequence. We implemented a nice interface, random number generator 1D. We used this sequence in our Monte Carlo integrator 1D by generalizing this code to Monte Carlo integrator from random number generator 1D. So we supplied this. You can find all this in our uh, code repository here if you would like to play with it. You may wonder why I supplied this supplier of the sequence. So you may wonder a little bit why here in the code, I'm not passing the sequence. I'm passing a method that creates a new sequence. The reason is that I create the sequence in the integrate function at this point. This means whenever I call integrate again and again, he will recreate the sequence and start from the beginning. This is a little subtle thing, and it's also a matter of taste. Do you like to have the effect that when you call integrate again and again, you always integrate with a different part of the sequence? In that case, you can use one sequence and just call always the next value on the sequence. If you would like to have the feature that integrate 
always gives you the same sequence from the beginning, then you either need to reset your index of the sequence or you need to recreate the sequence. So that means the method is idempotent. That means when I call the method again, I get the same result. This is a small remark here in the script on immutable objects and idempotent methods. So immutable object is an object whose state cannot be modified after it is created and an idempotent method is a method that has no additional effect when it's called more than once. And I did this because I would like to have that in my function integrate, I would have the same result when I call it a second time. Yeah? So it should not have a side effect on the result if I call it multiple times. We will discuss this um, aspect on immutable objects uh, later again, but this is just a remark in case you wondered a little bit why I did this in this way. Here are a few other suggestions for experiments you can do. Integrate now with our different integrators, x to the power of three. And yeah, maybe in the next section, we can have again now a look at the discrepancy and investigate a little bit the discrepancy of the different sequences we have created so far. That was it for today. So next session is low discrepancy in higher dimensions, low discrepancy sequences in higher dimensions. Yeah, and uh, we will of course then do also Monte Carlo integration with these sequences.